Love is the key. John chapter 3, if you're there with me, if you'll just stand briefly for the re uh, reading of God's Word. I'd appreciate it if you're capable. If you're not, we understand. Please don't uh, harm yourself physically to stand with us. At, uh, I want you to look at verse number, uh, number 14, if we would. We'll begin there. And the Bible says, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that, the, uh, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And then I want you to turn to Ephesians chapter 2 with me very quickly, if you would. Ephesians chapter number 2. Ephesians chapter number 2, very quickly. And uh, I want you to begin reading with me in verse number 1. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 1. When you're there, say amen. 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 And if you're not there, say, oh me, so I can wait a little longer. All right. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 1. And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sin, where in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation in time past, in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling desires of the flesh and of the mind, were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. Notice verse 4, But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love, wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ, by grace are ye saved. And then turn to First John chapter 3 with me, if you would, very quickly. First John chapter number 3. First John chapter number 3. And look with me at verse number 14, if you would. First John chapter 3 and verse 14. First John 3:14. The Bible says, We know that we have passed from death unto life because we love the brethren. He that loveth not his brother abideth in death. Whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer, and ye know, and ye know that no murderer hath eternal life abiding in him. Hereby we perceive the love of God because he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. But whosoever hath this world's good, and seeth his brother have need, and shutteth up his bowels of compassion from him. How dwelleth the love of God in him? My little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our Father, we love you this morning, and Father, I sure need you today. I ask you to help me. Now, Father, I have wrestled and wrestled and wrestled, and and have so many things I want to say, so many directions I want to go, even prepared another message that I wanted to preach that I feel like you don't want me to preach this morning. And so, Lord, I, I do want to follow you and obey you, and I do want to be a, a servant you can use. I want you to speak to hearts. Father, please help me. I need your help. Holy Ghost of God, I yield myself to you as best I can and ask you to meet with us today. Please, Father, in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you. you may be seated. Just going to talk a little bit about love today. And we're going to talk about, first of all, we're going to talk about love, God's love, amen, the great love of God. We found there in Ephesians chapter five, uh, 2 and verse 4 where it says, But God, who is rich in mercy for his great love, wherewith he loved us. In John 3, 16, it says, For God so loved the world. He didn't just love the world, but he so loved the world. And so he loved them so in such a way. There was such a way that God loved the world. What was that, what was that way? That way was, was so, he loved us so much that Christ was, was sent to die for our sins. But Christ didn't just die for our sins. Christ suffered for our sins. We don't have time to go to Isaiah chapter 53. But we'll find there that, uh, that there he, he bore our sins. He carried our souls. There we find that uh, he was despised and rejected men. There we find that it pleased God to bruise the Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. There we find that God saw the suffering of Jesus on the cross of Calvary, and he said the suffering was sufficient to pay 
for every man's hell for all eternity. You and I cannot comprehend what kind of suffering Christ went through so that we could be saved. You and I can't comprehend what kind of love it took the Father to send His Son and then to literally bruise His Son, to literally place upon His Son all the condemnation of sin, such great love. God so loved the world. Why did he love the world? He gave God something. Why? So that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. But the Bible says that Christ laid down his life for his enemies. You and I, before we were saved, we were enemies of God. Now, we don't like that. We don't like a lot of things the Bible says about us, but it doesn't make them not true. Amen? We like to think that we were good people. We're not good people. We're sinners. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Amen? There is none righteous. No, not one. There is none that seeketh after God. In our in our Adamic nature that was passed to us when we, were, when we were born, we are nothing but filthy rags in the sight of God. We are deserving of hell. In fact, let me put it to you this way. God hated sin so much, He decided to kill us twice. First, the physical death. If we had Adam and Eve had not sinned, they would still be able to take part of the tree of life and live forever. And God said, when you eat that fruit, you're going to die that day. And you're going to die. And so we got a physical death. But he says, I'm going to tell you this. And more importantly, I hate sin so much, I'm going to send you to the second death. The second death is eternity in the lake of fire. All have sinned. There's no escaping that second death except through what Jesus Christ did on the cross of Calvary. Amen. And I'm talking to the choir here. So I'm not spending a lot of time on this morning, but perhaps you know, yeah, maybe someone here, a child or somebody who not really truly has accepted Christ as Savior. I want you to know that God loves you. Amen. God loves you so much that he gave his son to die an excruciating, horrible death. And I tell you, one of the worst things about the crucifixion was those, those hours when Jesus was separated from the Father. You see, he made this statement, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He had prayed in John 17 to the Father. And he said, Father, I want you to make sure that you restore unto me the fellowship that we had before the foundation of the world. He knew, and he said, I want to not drink this cup. Well, what was the cup? I don't think the cup was so much that he had to suffer our hell for us. I think the cup was that he had to experience separation from God for that time. Can I tell you the worst part about hell is probably not the fire, So that's, but that's very true. It's probably not the gnashing teeth, but what's the worst part about hell is recognizing that you'll never have any God in your life ever. For all eternity, God will never hear a prayer. God will never meet a need. God will never comfort a pain. God will never comfort a sorrow. And God said, quite frankly, I don't want that to happen to anybody. The book of 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 9 tells us that, uh, that God is uh, long-suffering to us. We're not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And God today isn't keeping people from heaven. People are keeping people from from heaven. Amen. God isn't keeping anybody from heaven. Our sin is not really keeping us from heaven. Our sin has condemned us to heaven, to hell. But what's keeping us from heaven is the fact that we won't choose to put our faith in Jesus Christ. We won't choose to believe in him. Amen. Just simple faith. God said it. That settles it. I believe it. Amen. I'm a sinner. I deserve hell. Jesus died so I go to heaven. And he rose again so I could be saved. I believe it. That se- I settles it. It's settled. God said it. It's settled. And I believe it. And that's why I'm saved this morning. Not because I'm good. Not because I've done any works. Not because I joined a church. Not because I was baptized or catechized or sanforized or pasteurized or any other eyes. Amen. But because at one point in my life I realized I'm a sinner. My sin has sent me to hell. And God so love me. He sent his son to die on the cross. And I said, yes, I want that. Amen. It was very simple salvation that I had. I came under conviction knew I was going to hell. I fought God for a few moments. I turned loose at the pew, stepped out in the aisle and said in my heart, okay. And I got saved right there. I didn't have to pray a fancy. I didn't have to pray a fancy prayer. I didn't have to go through any religious classes. I didn't have to do any good deeds. I didn't have to be be baptized, become a member of church. All I had to do is just say, "Okay, I believe. I accept the gift." And I got saved. For God so loved the world. But I want to say that God's love has not just ended with the salvation. But go with me to Jeremiah chapter thirty-one very quickly. Jeremiah chapter thirty-one. I love this passage of scripture. I know it's an Old Testament passage, and I know that the the main uh, main uh, uh, 
the context of this passage is that God is talking to the children of Israel. But I take you, tell you to take some time, study over in the New Testament. You'll find that we became the children of Abraham by accepting Christ as Savior. Amen? Amen. And we have entered into spiritual Israel. Amen? And uh, there are Jews that are not saved are going to go to hell. But we as Gentiles, the middle wall of petition was broken down, amen, so that you and I could become the children of Abraham, amen. And I'm not doing that into some type of Abrahamic uh, religious type thing, but just touching this. And I believe that what applies to the Jews, God's promises uh, that apply to the Jews, they apply to me, amen. I mean, I'm going to get to enter. We're entered into the new covenant. Well, the new covenant. God talked about the new covenant. They will longer say no God but they shall know him for he shall be with them for he shall be in them the day I got saved I entered into that new covenant that the Jews are going to get in the future amen but I got it with Jesus amen that's what Jesus came for I don't have time for a big study on that but I just want to tell you that I love this verse in Jeremiah chapter 31 and verse 3 it says the Lord hath appeared of old unto me saying yea I have loved thee with an everlasting love. I like that, don't you? That God loves me with an everlasting love. Amen? Uh, everlasting. It will never end, Brother Ken. He'll never quit loving me. Amen? I like that. I like that. May, my friends may quit loving me. Amen? Uh, some of my family may quit loving me. Amen? Some of my fellow man may quit loving me. Amen? The federal government may quit loving me. Amen? But my God will never quit loving me. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. That ought to make a Baptist shout just a little bit. Amen? For God so loved the world. Greater love. You know what? I, I love the, the love of my wife. Amen. Uh, she is the love of my life. Amen. I love her. I love her deeply. She's been with me uh, 39 years, be 40 years in June. We'll celebrate. Uh, she's been a wonderful, faithful, loving wife. And I thank God. But my Savior's been my Savior for 55 years. Amen. Be 56 years here shortly. And I'm going to say that he has been a faithful, loving Savior, a faithful, loving God. Amen. He has never forsaken me. He said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Amen. He has never given up on me. And I want to thank God for that. Uh, you've heard my testimony, many of you. At six years of age, my grandmother said I'd be in prison someday. And I would have been in prison someday, except there was a God who loved me with an everlasting love and said, I won't let you go. I won't quit working on your life. I like that verse at God. It is God which worketh in us both to will and do of his good pleasure. I like that word that verse in the Bible where it says that God has predestinated us not to heaven or hell, but to be conformed to the image of his son. Amen. I know my works for you. Uh, I, I know that God says, and I love you with an ever lasting love. And I'm so thankful. I'm thankful for salvation, amen, that comes through Jesus. I'm thankful for security, which comes from, from God. And I'm thankful for sanctification, which comes from God. What is sanctification? Sanctification is being set apart and becoming like Jesus. And God says that His work, that He, that as we have borne the image of the earthly, so shall we bear the image of the heavenly. And He is conforming me to the image of Christ right now. I am not like Christ, but I'm becoming more and more like Christ. And that is sanctification. I mean, we were to sanctification means a, a, a lot of us it means sinlessness. And of course Jesus was sinless. And so one thing that should be happening in our life is we should be gaining victory over sin. The sins I used to do, I'm not doing anymore. Praise God. Hallelujah. I still got some sins that God has to work on. But thank God I can look back on my life and I can see how God has worked in my heart and my mind to help me become more righteous. Not self-righteous, not holier than thou, but just right doing. There is no pleasure in wrongdoing if you're saved. If you're saved, you have the Spirit of God, and the Spirit convicts you of sin. Amen. And the Bible says that if you're saved, you have God as your Savior, that He's going to chasten you when you sin. It's like the little child who, when he knows he shouldn't take the cookie out of the cookie jar, there's something inside him says, that's a wrong thing to do. Amen. And when he gets done doing it, he feels guilty. Amen. Guilt. God has used guilt in my life. Not a real pleasant thing that we like, but guilt in my life to make me become like Jesus, to stop doing what I shouldn't have done. And he's used his love and his mercy to draw me to be like Jesus because I realize if God loved me so much that, uh, that, that, I should be, uh, that I should be drawn to him. We love him because he first loved us. Thank God for his love. There's no greater love that we could be sharing at Valentine's Day than the love of God. Amen? 
You know, we, maybe we should get a big heart with a, a candy out there and take it out in the community and say, this is because Jesus loves you, amen? And we just want to give you some candy. While we're giving you some candy, we want to give you the greatest news, the greatest story that ever was told, that Christ died for sinners, amen, so that sinners could be saved. The love of God, oh, I tell you what, the love of God is greater far than tongue or pen can ever tell. It goes beyond the highest star and reaches to the lowest hell. Oh, love of God, how rich and pure, how measureless and strong, yet it shall forevermore endure the saints and angels' song. Could we with ink the ocean fill, and were the sky of parchment made, and were the, were the uh, stock on earth a quill, as <laughs> merchant made, uh, to write the love of God above would drain the oceans dry, nor could the scroll contain the whole, though stretched from sky to sky. You and I cannot even write, uh, you couldn't write the fathomness of it. He said, I want you to know the depth and the breadth and the length and the height of his mercy and his love. And you and I will never go so far to this direction that we can get out of the love of God. We'll never go so far this direction that we get out of his love. We can never go so deep in the problems or something in life that we'll ever get out of his love. And we can never fly high enough that we can get out of the love of God. It is all encompassing. Amen. It is enduring forever. Amen. It is an everlasting love. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. I just want to say tonight, this morning, that I want us to understand the great love of God. Realize how much God loves us this morning. He loves you. He loves you more than you can comprehend. He loves you more than a father loves his children. He loves you more than the, and anybody in this world, in this universe. He loves you. And I want you to get that. The thing he wants most is he wants us to be saved. But then back there in 1 John and chapter 3 and uh, verse number, uh, verse number uh, look with me if you would at verse number 18. And then we see the Bible says, My little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. Because God loves us, the Bible teaches that we need to love some things. Amen? Now, I want to just preach this morning very quickly on how's your love life. How's your love life? Take your Bibles and turn to Deuteronomy chapter 6. Deuteronomy chapter 6. How's your love life? Hey, hey, I mean this. I mean this. Many times we don't really evaluate how we love and what we love. We go through life so many times without even taking time to evaluate and taking time to be honest about things. I tell you, we're, we're like a bunch of robots. Now, really, I don't like Christianity as not to be robotic. We're not supposed to be like the world uh, wound up by a little key and marching along just like everybody else does. We're supposed to be different. We're supposed to be totally different. Our whole life is to be lived different. Our whole philosophy is to be different. Our whole attitude is to be different. Everything about us is to be different. We're not to be like the world. Amen. Our love isn't supposed to be like theirs. You know, their love is uh, either playboy love, that's lust, or it's Hollywood love, that's emotion. Amen. And we're supposed to have genuine love. Amen. A genuine love, a love that endures all things. A love that behave, doesn't behave so. A love that thinketh no evil. A love that hopeth all things. Yeah, we need to have that kind. A love like God. We're supposed to love like God loved. Amen. Amen. And amen. And so, uh, uh, how is your love life? No, Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 5, look what it says. Are you there? Say amen. amen. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, with all thy soul, with all thy might. Number one, I want to just talk to you about this morning about the things we should love. Number one, we should love God. Do you love God this morning? I mean, do you really love God this morning? I'm not talking about a superficial love. I'm not talking about a, a, a cheap love. I'm talking about a deep, abiding. I mean, a, a passionate, a numero uno love. Amen? I mean, God says that this is, that this is what all the, the first and great commandment is, love the Lord thy God. He was asking in Matthew chapter 22, what's the great commandment? He said, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all, soul, all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. Can I tell you what I believe the greatest sin that you and I as Christians commit? The greatest sin that we commit is not cursing. The greatest sin that we commit is not, uh, uh, not drinking. The greatest sin we commit is not lying or being jealous or being covetous. Right? The greatest sin we commit is not loving God with all our heart, not loving God like we should. God should have, a, the, the love for God should be greater than anything in our life. 
Can I tell you, if you love God like you should, you'll keep his commandments. Jesus said in John 14, 15, he that loveth me, he it is that, he, he, if you love me, keep my commandments. John 14, 21, he that loveth me, he it is that keepeth my commandments. Amen. Go down to John 14, 23, and he says, he that loveth me, keepeth my commandments, he that loveth me not, keepeth not my commandments. And then go to 1 John chapter 5, I believe it's verse number 4, and it, said, uh, it says, he that loveth me, keepeth my commandments, and my commandments are not grievous. He said, if you love me, you love me like you're supposed to love me, you will do what I say. He says, look, I don't really want to, I'm not looking at your emotions, I'm looking at your actions. Well, I don't feel love. You know what? Sometimes you don't feel love. But when you love, you do. Love is a commandment, which means love is an action. Which means whether I feel like loving my wife, I've been commanded to love her. And love is a certain type of behavior, a certain type of action, a certain type of, of doing. Amen. He said, if you love me, keep my commandments. He said, Jesus went, said to Peter, Peter, I want you to say you love me. When Peter said, I like you, he said, now keep my commandments. Go feed my sheep. Do you love God this morning? I was preaching at football camp, preaching a message on ye that love the Lord, hate evil. And I made this statement. It says there are those who love the Lord, those who don't love the Lord. And I said in that statement, you know, I, I, I don't love the Lord like I should. And the moment I said that, the whole auditorium just broke and everybody came to the altar. See, the Holy Ghost of God that day wanted to get the message out. Do you love me? How much do you love me? Do you love me with all your heart? Do you love me with a love that causes you to say, yes, I'll do that even if I don't want to, even if it's hard or difficult and it doesn't bring pleasure to me? I'll do it because I love you. I do things for my wife that I don't like doing. And you fellas have to do that, little honey-do list. Amen. Take out the garbage, Amen. I don't do that much, so my wife can frown at me, but I do do it sometimes. But that's one of my least favorite chores. I don't like the smell of garbage. I don't like pushing my hand down in there. I don't know what it is about it, amen. I mean, I'll go mow a yard for hours and hours, and I'll paint, and I'll do any other thing, but I don't like carrying out the garbage, amen. But you know what? I do things before her because I love her. You know, I prefer her above myself many times. There are many times I want to say to her, now get out of my way. You, you get out of my way. And let, no, but I have, to, I have to step back and say, go ahead. That's called love. Amen. That's what love does. Amen. God says, I want you to love me with all my heart, with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind. I'm asking you this morning, how's your love life for God? How much do you love Him? Did you get up this morning and say, I love you? We should sing that song. I love you, Lord, and I lift my voice. We sang it, but that ought to be a morning song, amen? I mean, the first thing that we ought to say when we get up in the morning, and I don't do it all the time, but I try to practice it, is look up to heaven and say, God, I want you to know I love you today. I love you. I talk to God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, okay? I know they're one, but they're three persons, amen? I can't understand all that, but I just believe that all three of them deserve to be talked to because all three of them have a name, amen? And I just get up and say, Father, I love you today. Son, I, Lord Jesus, I love you today. Holy Spirit, I love you today. I want you to know I love you. And Father, I want to show you that I love you. I want to try to please you today in the way that I live. How much do you love the Lord? How's your love life? Amen. Can I tell you, if you love God like you should, you'll love your wife like you should. If you love God like you should, you'll love your wife, your, your husband like you should. Can I tell you, if you love God like you should, you'll love your children like you should. Can I tell you, if you love God like you should, you'll love everybody in this world like you should. And by the way, I'm going to get ahead of myself, but we're supposed to love everybody. Amen. That doesn't mean we condone what they do. That doesn't mean we never correct them. That doesn't mean that we never even do judgment upon people. But we need to understand that we're supposed to love them. Even when God judges mankind, I believe he still has love in his heart. Amen? And we should be that. Do you love God like you should? Amen and amen. Number two, take your Bibles, go to Leviticus chapter 19. Leviticus chapter number 19. And look there with me, Leviticus chapter number 19. The Lord said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart. How's your love life? How are you doing this morning? Well, preacher, I think I'd be kind of like what you said at that football camp. I don't love God like I should. Hmm. 
Well, I'm glad at that particular service the Holy Ghost was working and one young man could not stand it and ran to an altar before the message had hardly started. And behind him, another evangelist hit the altar, and within about 15 seconds, everybody was at the altar. You know what everybody was willing to do? Say, God, I don't love you like I should. And I tell you, we had a great moving of the Holy Ghost and a great working in lives that day, and people's lives were changed because they got the greatest love right, which is the love for God. Can I tell you, if you'll get that love right, you'll get every, it'll, it'll change your life. Now, I didn't get into the ministry because I had to. I got into ministry because God called me, and I got to the place where I said, I love you, I'm going to do it. I haven't stayed in the ministry for 30 years because it's been easy or because everything God's asked me to do. No, I've stayed in the ministry because at the bottom line, when you boil it all down and you take everything away, the reason I'm in the ministry is because I love God. The reason I'm in church is because I love God. The reason I read my Bibles is because I love God. The reason I pray is because I love God. The reason I try to tell people about Christ is because I love God. The reason I try to live holy and righteous is because I love God. Hey, there's going to be some rewards but I'm not doing it for the rewards I'm doing it for love amen and I'm not doing it for duty I'm doing it for devotion amen and duty can get old and dry and you'll quit on duty but you'll never quit if you keep in love love God love him he loves you Whew. how much does he love you have you ever just said you know we don't do enough meditating I was preaching at a church not long ago, and I mentioned about meditating. The preacher came up and said, Preacher, you're so right. Now meditate. The Bible teaches, teaches us to read the Word of God, and it teaches us to meditate upon the Word of God. It teaches us meditate. I'm not talking about transcendental meditation. I'm talking about spiritual meditation, where you just sit down and you just start thinking about the wonderful things that you've seen in the Bible, the wonderful things about God, and you just start letting it go through your mind, and then you let the Holy Spirit start speaking to you. And I'll tell you what, you can have a personal revival right there in your little prayer closet if you just take some time to meditate upon the love of God. You know what I do when I get discouraged? I start thinking about how much God loves me. I start counting the ways. I start counting the blessings. When upon life billows you are tempest tossed when you are discouraged so you don't count your many blessings I just sit there and say God I love you and I know you love me thank you Lord for saving my soul thank you Lord for, for keeping me thank you Lord for never giving up on me thank you for saving my wife and my children I just go through all the God's acts of love and before you know it I'm no longer discouraged or defeated I'm happy and on my way to a revival because I meditated upon the good love of God amen meditate you're so busy. You know, we think what makes a great life is how much we can pack into it. How much we can get and how much we get to do. We are so lousy, busy now as a people, we don't have any time to meditate. I grew up in the country. I grew up driving a tractor, Brother Ken. You know what I had hours and hours and hours and hours and hours and hours and hours to do? Think. You know, my grandfather didn't believe in power steering. He didn't believe in power brakes. He didn't believe in cabs with air conditioning. He didn't believe in radios. He barely, he barely believed in an umbrella over the thing. We pulled a 3 by 14 bottom plow. It didn't take much depth there, amen. I don't know. It seemed like it took a thousand trips around that 80 acres to get that thing plowed. Day in and day out. The guy across the street had a big versatile with one of them big long uh, 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 12 or 13 uh, uh, sheared uh, plows and he'd come in and start in the morning and about by noon he'd be done plowing. I'm still just not even a third of the way around the field. I said to Grandpa, I said, Grandpa, how come you don't buy a big versatile like that so we can get done plowing in half a day? He said, because all he's going to do is go down to the coffee shop and complain about the price of wheat. I'd rather just plow my ground. Amen. Amen. And so I just stay a day long, day out, and think, time to think, time to think. Well, you know, an idle mind is the devil's workshop. But I learned that I could dwell on the right types of things, that I could think about the goodness of God, that I could think about his word, and that I could in out there, and I'd, I would think about it. And then I'd be traveling along, and I'd sing, Amazing Grace. I know what you're thinking. Wish you could sing now. You wished I could. Amen. And I'd just sing at the top of my lungs because I wanted to hear myself over that lawnmower muffler. And I never thought about it as a boy, but I've been thinking about it as an adult 
thought, wonder what those people thought when they come by there and hear that guy singing, Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. You know, I don't care. You know what it did? It gave me a, a, a joy and a happiness in my life. Listen, I'm afraid so many Christians are not happy because we are not dwelling on the love of God. Amen. Man, aren't you glad that when everybody else, David said this way, if my mother and father forsake me, the Lord will pick me up, lift me up. Amen. Shh. He's good. Well, Leviticus chapter 9, verse 18. It says, Thou shalt not avenge nor bear any judgment against the children of thy people, but thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. I am the Lord. Number one, how's your love life? Some things we should love. We should love God. Number two, we should love our neighbor. Over there in Matthew 22, he said, What is the great commandment? Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and all soul and mind. That's the first great commandment. The next he says in Matthew 22 and verse 39, And the second is like unto it, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. You know, things aren't as neighborly as they used to be. I grew up in Haven, Kansas. I knew everybody on the block. We kids would play capture the flag and kick the can and hide and seek until 10, 30, 11 o'clock at night. All the parents, would, they would get together and talk to each other across the back fence and go to each other's house, and we'd have neighborhood get-togethers. And You know what? I, I, I have lived in Jefferson City. I lived there for 28 years. I had neighbors that wouldn't even talk to me. We've lost this loving our neighbor. You know, those people out there, well, they don't like you, but they need to know you love them. They may be the meanest guy and cause you all kinds of trouble, and they may throw junk in your yard and, and all that kind of stuff and cause you all kinds of trouble, and I don't think it's wrong for you to go deal with that stuff, but they need to know that you love them. Amen. You know, the world will never accept a Christ whose people are ugly. Amen. We need to love people. Amen. By the way, I don't condone sin. I don't condone any sin. I don't condone my own sin. Amen. By the way, I'm harder on my sin than I am on anybody else's sin. I don't tell you what, I'm not going to condone sin. I'm not going to say sin's all right. But I'm going to tell you what, I'm going to love the sinner. Amen? I'm going to love them. And they, they may end up dying and going to hell, and I may, some of the things they do are despicable, I'm still going to love them. I love their soul. Amen. We're to love our neighbor. Your world will be a whole lot better place if the folks just start loving each other. The Bible says, love worketh no ill to his neighbor. If you got ill will in your heart towards a neighbor, you're not loving them like you should. If you decide you're going to do something that's ill to your neighbor, you're not loving like you should. You know, they smite you on the right cheek, turn the left also. I don't think, I don't think that means you have to let people abuse you. I think it's God trying to teach you that you and I need, as loving people, we need to accept people who are going to do things they shouldn't do, and you and I need to love them in spite of those things. We need to let them know that, that, that you love them and that there's somebody else who loves them, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? How are you doing? How's your love life on loving your neighbor? By the way, who is my neighbor? Everybody. Everybody. When that man asked who is my neighbor, Jesus said, I, I want to tell you a story about this guy called the Good Samaritan. I'll tell you about the story about this guy who went down and fell amongst thieves. And the priest came by and went on the other side. The Levite came by on the other side. Here came down this dirty old dog Samaritan. Amen. That's what Jews thought. This, uh, this uh, mixed breed Jew and, 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 uh, and whatever the other one was. I don't remember what it was. Syrian, I think it was. Okay. Mixed. And they say, well, you know, they're just a bunch of dogs. They don't deserve. They deserve to just go to hell. But this Samaritan looked at this man's need. And he says, my heart is moved with compassion. He put him on his own donkey, poured in wine and oil, took him to an inn, spent the night nursing him back. And when he had to get up in the morning to continue his travel, he gave money to the innkeeper and said, take care of him until he's well. And if, I, if you spend more money than what I've given you, when I come back, I'll pay the rest of the bill. And Jesus said, who was then friend of that neighbor? Who loved him? That Samaritan did. Can I tell you, we've become very, very calloused. I understand the day and ways we live. And we become very, very frightened. We have a lot of things that are keeping us from loving us. I do believe you need to be cautious. I do believe you need to be wise. Wise as servants, harmless as doves. But what we've done is we've closed up our bowels of compassion. Well, they're out just to get a quick handout. Maybe so, but Jesus loves them. Well, but look at their life. Maybe so, but he loved that woman caught in adultery. Amen. He said, if you're without sin, you cast a four stone. 
You know, he said, go out into the highways and compel, had, compel them to come in. Go ye into the lane. Bring into hither the poor, the maimed, the blind, and the halt, that my house may be filled. Amen? Where's the compassion? I mean, look, I know we got homeless in this town. You say, well, they deserve what they get because they're too lazy. Well, you don't know that, but that's not compassionate. Amen? Now, if they prove themselves to be lazy, the Bible says if a man won't work, let him not eat. Amen? So you got to have some discernment. Amen? But even if I have to say no to somebody, I want to say no to somebody with a love in my heart. Here's what I usually say to people. I, I, I'll do anything I, can't for, I can for you, but I won't do what I can't. 26 years of pastoring. People come to me and say, look, I'll do anything I can for you, but I won't do what I can't. I won't lie for you. I won't change the Bible for you. I can't do this because if I do this, it's enabling you to continue to do wrong. But I want you to know I love you. I had some people that I couldn't do certain things for. And I'd say to them, if I could do it for anybody, I'd do it for you. But I won't change the Bible for my mother, so I won't change it for you. But I want you to know I still love you. I'm not going to cr criticize and condemn you and treat you badly. I'm also not going to praise you for what you did. But I want you to know I love you. I want to help you. I want to do what I can for you. That's loving our neighbor. Amen. I know it's kind of scary, and I, 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 don't, I suggest that we be wise. You know, as a boy, if somebody's broke down the side of the road, you stopped and helped them. Saw so somebody struggling out in their yard with something, yeah, walk, stop, and say, can I help you with that? And you helped them. You were neighborly, and people accepted it. And now people really are scared if you do that. They think you're after something. But it would be nice if they could get to believing that there are still some humans in this world that really, genuinely love their neighbor. Amen. I got a deal just yesterday from the rescue mission here in town. And during Christmas time, I got moved to give some money. Look, I don't know why all those people are in those conditions. I really don't care. I just know this. I know that God says that we're supposed to take care of the poor. Amen. And we see somebody's got a need, and we have the ability to meet the need, and we say we love them, we don't meet the need, we got a problem. Amen. Can I tell you, we've become very selfish. You know what we've done? We have raised up our own little personal, uh, personal financial banks. It's mine and I'm keeping all of it. Good for you. But when you die, you don't get anything for the things you kept. You get something for the things you gave. Do you love your neighbor? How you doing? How's your love life? Go to Matthew chapter 5 very quickly i got to get done. I'm not even get halfway through the sermon. That's okay. I don't usually get through most of them. Matthew chapter 5. And look at me at verse number 43. By the way, can I just say this as kindly as I can? What does it say about our love when we won't talk to anybody about Jesus? I didn't say when we can't talk to anybody about Jesus. I said when we won't talk to anybody about Jesus. Let's quit. Let's, let's be honest. It's not that we can't. It's that we don't. How's your love life? Oh, how I love Jesus. But I won't tell anybody about him. Oh, how I love Jesus. But I won't help anybody. Oh, how I love Jesus. Amen. How's your love life? Look at Matthew chapter 5, verse 43. Matthew chapter 5, verse 43. Ye have heard that it hath been said that thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. But I say unto you, love your enemies. How's your love life? You're supposed to love your enemies. How's your love life? You got any enemies? I, I have some people who are my enemies, but I'm not their enemy. I refuse to be anybody's enemy. They can be mine. I'm not going to be their enemy. 26 years of pastoring, I had some people that got upset with me. I had some people that got mad at me. I had some people that treated me very badly. Very badly. I didn't deserve it. But they did it. They hate me, but I love them. And the moment they did it, I started praying for them. Bless them. Pray for them. If the enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirsts, give him drink. 
I still pray today for one guy who did me really dirty. I pray for him today, every day of my life. I pray he has cancer. I pray for him to be healed. Later on, years after he'd done what he did, he left our church, gone elsewhere. He called me up one day. He said, Brother Houston, I'm looking for such a book. Do you have it? I said, sure, brother. You come over to my house. You can borrow it. When he came to my house, I didn't chew him out, cuss him out. I didn't treat him. I said, brother, so good to see you. Here, I hope this will be a help to you. How are things going in your life? I'm no great person, but I learned something that God expects me to love him. You know what I found? I found it's very liberating. I tell you what, it will remove from you the acidity of bitterness and the destruction of hatred and anger that destroys so many people. Look, I, I used to have a temper like crazy. And I used to be so, you'll get yours. I not, don't get mad, I get even. Amen. I was a payback guy. And God helped me. And sometimes my, my family sometimes said, well, now you've gotten so where you don't hardly ever get mad when you ought to. Well, hallelujah. Praise the Lord. I'd rather be that way than getting mad all the time. My enemies. Well, God says if your enemies, you'll put hot, hot, hot coals on it. If you want to do it for a, an ulterior motive, put whole hot coals on their head for, because you do kind to them. He also warns that if you start rejoicing when bad happens to him, he's going to stop his judgment on them. So you should love him because you love. But if you want an ulterior motive, then God's going to pour cold, cold coals on his fire. And if you start rejoicing about that, God's going to remove his hand so you can just keep him under pressure if you treat him kindly. Amen. I'm just kidding. We all should love them. Amen. Love them. Well, I got to get done here. I got to get done here. Take your Bibles and turn with me to, to uh, Ephesians chapter 5. This fits in with... Uh, fits in with the theme of, of Valentine's Day, Ephesians chapter 5, and look at verse 25, Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 25. There it says, husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church. And then drop down with me, if you would, at verse number, well, I can't get my page turned. Down with me at verse number uh, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 33. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife even as, as himself, and the wife see that she reverence her husband. Titus chapter 2, verse 4 says that the younger women may be taught by the aged women to love their husbands. How about this matter of your love for your husband, your love for your wife? Can I tell you the greatest ingredient to have a good marriage is love? Love. I had struggles when Julie and I got married. Julie was raised a different religion than I was. Julie was raised in a different time home than I was. Julie had uh, nine. There's nine in her family. We had three in our family. I was raised in the country. She was raised in the city. She was raised in a family where they're very high-pitched and very loud. I was raised in a family very quiet. You can't tell that now, but I was. We didn't say much. And uh, she lived in a family where you have a temper. You just blow off and, and do whatever you want to, and then everybody has to forgive you. And and, and that's the way she was. And, and, and she grew that way. I was different. Now, and, now I wasn't perfect. She had problems too. But, uh, I, but because of that, I was struggling. And I've, you've heard this testimony, some of you. And, and, and I was having trouble loving her. Because I was focusing all this, 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 this. She does this. She does this. She doesn't do this. She doesn't do this. She does. Does that sound like anybody's marriage? And God told me this passage one day, and he said, see that where it says husband? He said, read that. Where it says wives, don't read that. You're not a wife. That's not for you. You quit trying to change Julie, and you start changing Ted. He said, now, you need to love your wife. He says, does it say love your wife if she makes you happy, if she's always calm and quiet, if she never messes up, or she always does what? No, it says love her. And Ted, you need to just start loving her. And if you don't know how to love her, go to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Let me show you how to love her. And he showed me what charity did. And I said, okay. He said, when you love Julie the way that, that says, not, if she does nothing for you, she never does anything for you. If she never makes you happy, she never says a kind word. You love her that way. I'm not perfect at it. But I sure am trying to keep trying to love my wife in spite of me and in spite of her. Mostly in spite of me. Because the truth of the matter is, she's a wonderful lady. I'm just human like the rest of you. And as humans, we get irritated. And as humans, we look for things to get upset about. Love your, love your wife, love your spouse, love your husband. Well, I'm about done, we'll be done. I can see it's time to get close. Go with me, if you would, very quickly to 1 Peter chapter 2. And verse 17, i got three more. Quickly, we'll do these. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 17. 
First Peter chapter 2, verse 17. Look what the Bible says here. It says, honor all men. First Peter 2, 17. Honor all men. What's the next phrase? Love the brotherhood. Who's the brotherhood? Christians. First Peter 1, 22. Seeing you have purified your souls and obeying the truth through the spirit and unfeigned love of the brethren, see that you love one another. Christ said a new, new command I give unto you, that you love one another. Can I tell you that we're supposed to be, have brotherly love? Love the Christian. Amen? You may notice we say brother and sister around here. It's because we're a family. We should love each other. There's nothing worse in a church when two people get out of love with each other. It does huge damage to the church when people are at odds with each other. We're endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. Blessed are the peacemakers. I'm not talking about compromising here. Most of the times when I've seen people not love each other, it wasn't over a biblical issue. It was over a personal issue. You said, by the way, the tail-bearing and gossiping tongue needs to stop. Did you hear about Brother Stan? No, and I'm not going to either. But you need, no, I don't need to hear it. I don't want to hear it. I'm not going to hear it. You can keep it to yourself. If you have an issue with him, go to him. That's what love would do. Love would not reveal the matter to another. It doesn't reveal a secret to other people. Love keeps a secret and it has an issue. It goes to the person it has an issue with. Brother S.M. Davis taught me years ago, keep all sin in the smallest circle. Why do the devil's work? He's the accuser of the brethren. Well, the brother sinned. Well, if it doesn't need to be known by anybody else, then just take care of it between you and them. Amen. Uh, fulfill the love of Christ. Uh, 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 Ephesians chapter 6. If a man be, re be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness. Don't destroy such a one in the spirit. Restore such a one in the spirit of meekness. Go humbly and meek to them. And don't share with everybody else. Brother, I want to help you. I love you. I am just made it. By the way, considering thine own self, lest thou also be tempted. Well, boy, I'd never do that. That's a good way to end up doing it. For God resists the proud and gives faith, faith to the humble. Pride cometh before a fall. I'd never do something like that. I hope you don't. But you're on thin ice when you're proud. Love your brother. Amen. Two more. Psalm 122, verse 1. Turn there very quickly. Psalm 122 and verse 1. By the way, I've got a whole list of things we shouldn't love, but I'll not get to that today. Psalm 122 and verse 1. I'm listening for those pages to stop. I love what David says in Song of Degrees. He said, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. We should love church. I love church. I love being in church. I love going to church. I just can't imagine not being in church. Almost the greatest, most, the majority of the greatest things that have happened in my life happened in church. I got saved in church. I got sin out of my life by listening to the preaching in church. My wife, I married my wife and she got saved in church. Amen. My kids got saved because of church. I love church. I love the fellowship of God's people. I love, I love singing. I love just being here. I mean, it's just like this is my home. Amen. It's like I walk in and I'm out of the world in a place where God is and where God's blessing is, where God's people are. I love church. Amen. I love it. It ain't perfect because it's filled with sinners. Amen. But it's a wonderful place. And lastly, go to Psalm 126 and I'll be done. Psalm 126 and verse 5. Talk about how's your love life today? How's your love life towards God? How's your love life towards your neighbor, your enemy, your, your wife, your husband, your brother? How's your love life towards the church? And then lastly, Psalm 126, 5 through 6. They that sow in tears shall reap in joy. He that goeth forth weeping and bearing precious seed shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, 
bringing his sheaves with him. We're supposed to love souls. We're supposed to love souls. Do you love souls? You can't tell that most of us love souls by the amount of time we spend trying to reach them. I said we. Talking about me. I love people. I want to go to hell. But if I love souls like I should, I'd be doing more soul winning. I'd be more sowing in tears so I could reap in joy. At the very least, if we love souls, there ought to be tears streaming down our face when we think about somebody who's going to hell. You see, I don't think love is an emotion. It's an action. But I think it is tied to emotions. I think that most of us understand love by emotions. And doesn't it bother you when there's no emotional moving in your heart over people dying and going to hell? The Bible says when Jesus saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion. And when he looked at Jerusalem, the Bible says that he wept over Jerusalem. It said, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how long? How is it? We can go days, weeks, months, years, and not have one compassionate, loving desire to see somebody come to know Christ as Savior. How's your love life? He said, I want you to produce those things which become love. The deeds of love. How's your love life? Let's stand with our heads bowed.